Well, I'm here with uh, Doug Howard, the legendary percussionist and uh, principal percussionist with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. And I'm doing this series. Uh, I'm going to talk to some great percussionists. Um, I'm not going to say of the past, but <laughs> of an older vintage like myself. And actually, Doug is a, a generation before me, so he has some great insights on um, what we do as orchestra players and just percussionists. So the first thing I just want to ask you is, can you can you tell um, me about just your early years and how you got into playing? Well, I, I grew up in a small town uh, on the Tennessee, North Carolina border, really, just west of Asheville in, in East Tennessee. And uh, there wasn't much music there. <laughs> except for the radio, country music on the radio. Right, right. Uh, but my parents started me with with key piano lessons, you know, probably around the fifth grade, something like that, right. fourth or fifth grade. And then, then the fifth grade uh, was the first opportunity I had to be part of the, uh, the band program. <laughs> and I started out on the trombone oh, wow. in the fifth grade. And... <laughs> I didn't really practice a lot, and right. I and I, I wasn't real inspired by the trombone, right? And I dropped out. But the next year, sixth grade, one of my friends said, uh, "Hey, they're going to have a, a, a start a drum class this this year, and it's going to be a separate group from the from the rest of the wind players." Uh, I'm going to do it. Why don't you ju do it with me? Right. So I did. And uh, there were only two of us in the class. It was at the elementary school. Right. And I started playing drums. And the next year I was at the junior high school with a new director. And he encouraged us to uh, learn our rudiments. Mm -hmm. So I started learning the rudiments, uh, the 26 rudiments. And uh, at the end of the, when I learned them all, I was rewarded by the band director gave us, uh, those who did this, a dollar bill out of his own pocket. Wow. So that was my, <laughs> that was my, my motivation, <laughs> yeah. you know. So this was in probably around 1960. Okay, yeah. And um, so then fast forward to high school, ninth grade, uh, I really started to work on the rudiments at that point, and for the uh, contest at the end of the school year, I I played my first rudimental solo, the the Connecticut halftime, yeah, sure. for the competition, and I got really good good score and really good remarks, and uh, the next year, uh, a young man joined the band, who who lived in the same town, but he had not come up through the band program. He had been in a drum and bugle corps, right. and it was taught by some people uh, who had connections to the Blessed Sacrament Drum and Bugle Corps in sure. New Jersey. Yep. And he took me under his wing, and then I got really serious about, yeah. about the rudiments, and we put together a really nice little, uh, a small, drumline in the high school band yeah. um, and in those days the drum lines were a lot smaller yeah. anyway right but uh, then probably my summer of between my sophomore and junior years or junior and senior year my parents took a trip to New York a business trip and I stayed home and worked in the family business and when they came back, my mom had bought some recordings, uh, classical music uh, LPs at the at the Tower Records in New yeah, York. Sure. Yeah. And there was, you know, Beethoven Symphony, Schubert Symphony, yeah. some Mozart. And I started listening to those things, and and I really uh, enjoyed it. Got hooked on the classical music. Went off to college at the University of Tennessee in 1966. Uh, played in the marching band, but part of my scholarship was 
to play with the Knoxville Symphony, to be a student member of the Knoxville Symphony, which was a community orchestra, right, basically. Yeah, yeah. But my freshman year, the entire percussion section were were call it were students. Well, we had one sophomore and three freshmen. <laughs> and my freshman, and the tempest, the tempest had been the professor, the teacher at the at the university. But that, but he did he had stopped playing and. So we had a tempest who was a senior in high school. So needless to say, I learned uh, on-the-job training is right. what how it was, was. How was the conductor? Well, he was uh, very knowledgeable. Understanding. He, he, yeah, yeah. He, I remember playing Capriccio Espanol snare drum part as a freshman. Wow. Late in the year, in the spring. And being coached through the part in a rehearsal by the conductor because right. I didn't have any clue. You know, they're not, there's not much instruction in, in the right. part. Sure. For that fourth movement. Yep. And I didn't know that. You know, you. The tradition you, of it. You, yeah. The tradition yeah. of yeah. playing that part. So right. he coached me through it. Yeah. <laughs> in a, I would hate to hear. I hope there are no recordings of it. <laughs> I'll look for one. <laughs> <laughs> because. So I would be embarrassed. I'm sure to hear it. Yeah. Now. Oh, maybe not. But. Um, you know, the Vietnam War was going on while right. I was in, in school, and I, uh, we, they had a draft lottery my senior year. It was the first Vietnam War draft lottery, right. and I, I was in my car in the, in the music school parking lot listening to the, them on the radio draw the lottery numbers, wow. and my number came up pretty early. So I knew yeah. that I would likely be drafted when I when I finished my degree that that wow. coming spring. Yeah. So that was in the fall of 1969 when the lottery happened. So I turned off the radio, went into the music building, and I started practicing for for military band auditions. Right. Well. And so on spring break in uh, March of 1970, a friend and I made a trip to Washington D.C. I had arranged to audition for six military bands over a period of a week. And in those days, it was a little different from it, the way it is now. If they had an opening, if you contacted a military band and they had an opening, they would invite you to come and audition. Right. And apparently all those bands either had an opening or they were anticipating an opening soon. And so they all heard me. Oh, great. Wow. And... Uh, I was very fortunate. I, I was accepted by a couple of those bands, and I decided to go to the U.S. Air Force Concert Band. At the time, that band had probably the best conductor in the military music system, Colonel Arnold Gabriel. Okay. And uh, he, you know, he would he did clinics all over America for you know all state and all region right. kinds of clinics. So he was constantly yeah. doing that kind of stuff and. Yeah. And he had a good reputation, and I went uh, to that band and uh, played under Colonel Gabriel. And then, you know, once you're there, you're then you're starting to think about, well, now what, what am I going to do when I get out? Right. And I had a four-year enlistment. I started taking lessons, uh, occasionally driving to Philadelphia to study with Alan Abel. Mm -hmm. I did my master's degree with uh, Frank Anthony Ames, Tony Ames, okay, at right. the National Symphony in Washington, right. who just retired, well, maybe eight or ten years ago right. from that from that position. Um, I did my master's with Tony. I also met Cloyd Duff after a Cleveland Orchestra concert in Washington. And once I heard Mr. Duff play, I decided I really wanted to study with him. Mm -hmm. So I, he was a very nice, gracious man. Uh, talked to me for, you know, probably twenty minutes after a concert. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and and told me that if I would come to Cleveland, that he could give me some lessons. I I ordered some some of his timpani mallets from right. him right there on the spot. Yeah. And um, so I did that, also. And uh, I took one audition for a major orchestra while I was still in the band. 
and I was offered a job, which I had to turn down. What, what orchestra was that? I, I'd rather not say because, um, okay. I mean, off camera, I'll tell you, but okay, yeah, yeah. I don't, I, right? No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Um, anyway, um, I, uh, I was crushed by the fact that, first of all, I went to this audition just to, to get an audition experience behind me. Right. And I didn't really think I was ready. And my teacher said, I want you to go and don't worry about not being ready. I'll tell you if you're not ready. Right. <laughs> so you I went. You your teacher, you said. Uh, Mr. Tony. Oh, Tony, Tony, Tony Ames. Okay. Yeah, he. Um, so I went, was offered this job. Um, there was some chance that I might have gotten out of the Air Force, been able to. Right. But they weren't willing to take a risk. They needed a player and they needed somebody right away. Right. And so they offered it to someone else oh. uh, the next day. They waited a day. Right. And then they offered it to somebody else. I was crushed. Yeah. I thought that that could be it. That could have been my career right, right there, wow. you know. Yeah. Uh, but I... Uh, I was fortunate in my last year in the band. Uh, I heard about the potential for a, for an audition uh, in the Louisville Orchestra, mm -hmm. and I wrote them a letter. And I got a letter back, and they asked me to come to New York on a certain day in the I think it was February or March, uh, and uh, play for the music director, George Mester, who was. Um, he was, I guess he taught, he had one of the orchestras at, at Juilliard for a while. Oh, wow. Plus, he was the music director of the Louisville Orchestra. Okay. And I went in and played a short audition for him, and he offered me the job right away. Uh, they didn't have a big audition, a big cattle call. Right, right. And, in the, and, in, and then he said, he looked at me and he said, would you like to come to the Aspen Music Festival this summer? And I'm not sure I knew exactly where Aspen was, <laughs> even. Yeah. But I said, yes, I, yeah. I would love that. Right. So I, they awarded me a fellowship to go and study with Charles Owen. Yeah. And I, uh, I went to this festival, met Mr. Owen. I'd heard him play several times with the Philadelphia Orchestra, but I didn't really know him. Right. Turned out to become one, one of my mentors. Yeah. Um, and, and because of him, I was later invited to come back to be on the faculty. I played that year in Louisville, and in, in the spring uh, of that year, I auditioned for the Dallas principal job in the Dallas Symphony and, and won that audition. And I was in Dallas then with the orchestra for 43 years. So what, what year was that? It was 1975. Okay, well. Um, I... Uh, I also was asked, it, a couple of years later in 1977, I was asked to take over the percussion program at Southern Methodist University, right. and, which I did. And, and it wasn't much of a program right. at the time. Um, I inherited maybe two or three students. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, second, the first year, we didn't even ha really have enough people to do an ensemble. Yeah. Um, the second year, we, we started modestly putting together a percussion ensemble um and uh it, it grew yeah and uh to the to the point that we 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 had a you know a regular program and a regular ensemble and in fact it got too busy for me to uh, to keep it up to right. keep doing the ensemble so yeah. i brought in someone else to do that uh, and at first i taught the percussion methods class mm -hmm. but but also got got this person to do the methods class and yeah. and so it evolved from there right uh, and then we started adding faculty members because first thing i did was i brought in calman cherry mm -hmm. the timpanist of the dallas symphony who had been a teacher at smu but he had left over some kind of a dispute and i asked him to come back so he taught timpani and i taught the percussion and then you know the marimba repertoire was getting so yeah. uh involved yeah. and i was not a marimba so i really wasn't keeping up with with all of that right. so we brought in someone to teach marimba and then later 
I brought in someone to teach drum set. Mm -hmm. And eventually we had a, someone teaching jazz vibes. And we had uh, a Lebanese American teaching hand drumming, right. Dumbek especially. Great, yeah. So, and world music. Yeah. So it grew. And you, and you were the head of the program there. I was. Okay. Uh, so, you know, 40, 43 years later, uh, right. then I, I finished my t time with the symphony. I uh, was still teaching at the Aspen Music Festival uh, and playing another music festival. And I taught one more year at SMU. And, uh, and then I left that job and we moved to North Carolina. Yeah. Wow. So your whole career at, in Dallas, did you ever think about why you were why you were there taking any other jobs or interested in it? Well, you know, there was one other job that intrigued me and I was going to take the audition. It's an interesting story. Yeah. It was a uh, the the principal position in Pittsburgh opened mm -hmm. and it was also associate principal timpani. Okay. I was playing as assistant timpanist in Dallas, but I wasn't playing very much. Right. Timpani and I and I knew that the, because I had seen the Pittsburgh Orchestra, and I knew that the assistant played frequently, like right. most concerts play, maybe the concerto or right. something. Right. And so, I was prepared to take that audition, and in the morning of the, of the that I was flying up there, and I was flying up there early on the day of the audition because I had an afternoon time. Right. And I woke up to a, a snowstorm and hit hit Dallas. Oh, wow. But I went ahead to the airport and I was late getting to the airport and I thought I surely would miss my flight. And I ran in there and, and I asked him if the flight was left and the guy said, calm down, nothing, nothing has left the airport today. <laughs> so, but I got, I boarded my flight and we sat there on the ground for an hour or two waiting to be de-iced. Right. And the flight got canceled and I never oh, went to the audition. Oh so that was goodness. my only real foray into uh into the in, yeah. yeah but yeah. in the meantime my you know my wife had a had a job uh, as an oboist playing with the uh with the fort worth symphony right and so there was really no push to leave the texas right we were we were having a um we had good things happening and good things were going on yeah so so no i i, I never really considered except for that one time I never really considered leaving so one thing I, I wanted to um, ask you just being a pr principal percussionist for so long I, I've done it on and off you know maybe four years total but of my career but you you did it for how, how many years 43 43 years right. Wow and did you have the same section for the whole time pretty much uh, we had one change There were, you know, there were three, three of us in the section. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so mid, mid career there, let's see, uh, I was there in 75. So the first 21 years we had the same guys and then, yeah. and then he retired, one guy retired and we replaced him. And that was the section that was still there when I left. I see. So in, in, in your section, did you have certain uh, folks who would play, you know, more or less the same parts every time, or would you move around? Well, in the first 20 years, uh, we pretty much stayed in our little areas, right. you know. Right. And I did I did most of the mallet playing and, and a lot of the snare drum playing. Yeah. Um, one of the guys did mostly cymbals and the other one played bass drum and accessories right. and, th and that's I mean of course occasionally things have to get moved yeah. around but yeah. that's what we did right most of the time then 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 later after the new hire uh, then we were able to maybe move around a little bit more so some more versatility maybe. yeah exactly yeah, yeah. interesting um, so I, I want to also to ask you about some conductors uh, I'm sure you've worked with many, many, um, you know, when you're in an orchestra for that long, you, you see a lot of guest conductors and then you see, you know, the permanent ones you have for several years at a time. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular favorite that you had? 
Well, I worked for three different music directors. Right. And the first one uh, was a man that who I say he, he was a percussionist conductor. Hmm. Eduardo Mata was a Mexican conductor. Um, he was a pianist and had played some percussion yeah. as a university student in, right. in Mexico, uh, in Mexico City. And he was a student of the composer Carlos Chavez, right. uh, who wrote the, the, the famous Toccata right. for percussion and, and some other works for, yes. for percussion and the, and the Sinfonia India for yeah. orchestra, with yeah. which would be really interesting percussion writing. Great, great piece. Yeah. Uh, so, so Eduardo had probably the best, well, one of the best stick techniques I've ever seen, clear, precise. Yeah. Yeah. His sense of rhythm was impeccable. Great. And he's one of these guys that you could, you know, if, if you're, that's maybe you're playing cymbals and you need to put the cymbals down and turn and, and pick up some other instrument and you look back at the podium yeah. and he was always right where you thought he was going to be. So many times you would do that with other conductors and you go, you look away for a second and you look back and you go, where are we? <laughs> because, but he, Eduardo was always right where you thought yeah, he was going great. to be. Yeah. And um, in fact, there's a few video clips of him. There's a clip of him on YouTube uh, conducting the Symphonia India. And I watched it not that long ago and it just brought back all of these, these great memories of, of playing with a conductor who had that impeccable yeah. sense of timing. That's, that's great, yeah. And, and, and tight and rhythm. And rare. It's, rare. Pretty rare. It's rare, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he was one of my favorites. You know, I worked with, um, you know, some, well, Kurt Mazur, who later, he was a German conductor from East Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Dallas was the first America in first American orchestra that he really was allowed to conduct. Wow! And he became uh, principal guest conductor for a couple of years, and he later went on to be could, to be the director of the New York Philharmonic. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing him there. Um, yeah. There were a couple of other German conductors that that we saw. Uh, Gunter Herbig was mm -hmm. one who was who was good, and you know, in, in their in certain repertoire. Yeah, uh, Herbig was really great in Bruckner. Yeah, um, and Mahler. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, lot, there were a lot of them. Uh, Michael Tilson Thomas. We had a few okay. times. Yeah, uh, it was interesting to work with Michael. Um, he's very particular, isn't he? About certain yeah, things. he's he he is. He is. He's you know he he does a good job though. Yeah. Makes, makes music. He's, he's a good musician He's because he plays a lot of different styles of music. Yes. Oh, yes. Himself. Yes. So yes. That, that helps a lot. So um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, when you're in the orchestra, you know, everybody sort of has instruments they prefer to play and parts they prefer to play when you're principal. One of the good things about that is, is that you can choose and play whatever you want to play. Right. So uh, did you find yourself gravitating you know, once you've played Scheherazade, you know, 10 times or Capriccio 10 times, did you find yourself wanting to do any different parts? Uh, like maybe, you know, the tambourine part or or even that's got such a great bass drum part, Scheherazade, yeah. you know? No, um, I, I really didn't. I mean, um, I think, first of all, uh, when I got there, the person who hired me it was right before Mata came. Right. So they had kind of an interim person, uh, Louis Lane, who had okay. had been the assistant to George Zell and Cleveland Orchestra, right, right. And, and Louis was a very knowledgeable man. Yeah. But he asked me when I first got there, he told me what he expected in terms of what he wanted me to do. Right. right. And so that's that's why I played the majority of the of the mallet and and snare drum things whenever I, you know, I couldn't do both sometimes, right, right, but, but right. most often that's what I would do. Yeah. Um, so the, that went on, you know, for, for at least 20 years. Um, but no, I never tired of playing those parts. No, I, well, not, uh, not tired but, isn't the word. But, but, but one interesting yeah. thing about 
playing now in retirement as an extra percussionist in orchestras like like your orchestra here in in Charlotte yeah. or with the North Carolina Symphony um, and I've played you know I've played in weeks with uh, Atlanta and San Francisco and right. is playing different parts right you know and and I enjoy that yeah um, and you know I I, I love playing cymbals yeah uh, I love playing bass drum uh, and uh, so those are two areas that I've been seeming seemingly doing quite a bit of lately, and 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 I enjoy it. Yeah, it's kind of like new life, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because when I when I started doing that after I was playing other parts, yes, all those years, I really really enjoyed it. Yes, and uh, not that I didn't love playing those other parts, but it's kind of a whole new thing, you know. And uh, have, having played those other parts really helps yes with the understanding because there's a lot of guys especially you know in the old days like chicago symphony you got certain guys just playing cymbals yes. and this is you know sam and all, all all the um and then maybe snare drum their whole careers i know in the new york phil it was like that with walter yes he would tell me you know he did um most of them the mallet work pretty much yes all of it and then buster would do most of the snare drum work right, right. Right. And uh, and the Philadelphia Orchestra, the same kind of thing. But I think that's changed a lot now where sections are moving around more. I think it is. And yeah. I think it's healthy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a healthy thing. Um, I know from talking to Mr. Abel that his first years in the Philadelphia Orchestra, he was pretty frustrated because, you know, he was a fine player. He could do a lot of things. But he, was, he felt like he was stuck on bass drum right. almost all the time. Yeah. And... Um, you know, but there was a tradition in those days because he yeah. went there probably in the early 60s. Right. And the principal had been there since the 50s. Yeah. And both both uh, Michael Bookspan and, and uh, Charles Owen had been there since the early 50s. Yeah. So um, they had a way, they had their way of yeah. doing things. Yeah. And uh, so after um, after Charles Owen retired from the orchestra, he left early to go teach at the University of Michigan. Right. Then it opened up things for Alan. I think he was much happier after after that. I, I mean, I can't speak for him, but right. but that's what I gather. Yeah, yeah. From from the conversations we had. Yeah, yeah. That's the hard thing as a principal percussionist is you know keeping everybody interested. <laughs> Yes. For that long. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, you know, for me, uh, toward the end of my career, in the, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, I started playing more timpani in Dallas. Right. And that and that made me happy. Yeah. You know. Um, in fact, I played one whole season. Well, yeah, right, right. When, when, that, when, yeah. The, when Calvin Cherry suddenly decided he was going to retire right before the beginning of the season and there was no... Right. time to hold an audition and I moved over and played one season but prior to that he had had he'd had some vision problems and and I would get a call you know he's going to be out this week right so go in and play but the but the the the, the strangest one strange I guess is not the right word but we were doing a dress rehearsal on a Thursday morning for uh Mahler 9th yeah. And it was about 15 minutes before the beginning of the dress rehearsal. And Kyle walked over to me, and he was having a problem with one of his eyes. And he said, I, I can't see anything out of my left eye. Wow. And I'm leaving. I'm going home. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, I don't know. That's between you and the conductor. But I'm leaving. And there's two timpanists in that piece. No, there's only one in that one. In oh, the in that ninth. one. Yeah. Okay. Well, I never played Mahler Ninth before. I never really even looked at the timpani part, but I went to the personnel manager and the conductor, and I said, he was a guest conductor uh, who we had quite often. Yeah. And and uh, I said, uh, you know, here's the situation. What do we do? And right. and the conductor said, well, why don't you move over and play timpani, and we'll, and we'll get somebody in. They called immediately and got somebody to come down to, to play my parts percussion in the All percussion right. section, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I moved over and uh, we went we were going through the piece. Everything's going fine. 
And then we get to the fourth movement and he's looking at the clock and he says, okay, well, let's skip this part. Oh, and let's, yeah. let's, uh. let's go here, you know. <laughs> okay. So he skipped over a, a section of the piece. Yeah. And I didn't find out until I got to the concert that there's a transition, a tempo transition thing right. that happened there. And, and I never saw, I had never seen it in a rehearsal. Wow. So the first night I kind of stumbled a little bit. Yeah. And uh, the next night, the conductor was there early. He always came out early and looked around the stage and just right. checked everything out. And he, he, I was up there, you know, right. run through the part. And he comes back to me and he stuck out his hand. He shook my hand and he said, I apologize to you. I realized you never got a right, chance, right. chance to see yeah, that, that transition. That's so crazy. after that, it was fine. But, yeah. you know, anyway, that, that, that was kind of a, that was a, that's what you call jumping in with both feet, you okay. know, at the last second. Yep, it's going to happen, if, you know, <laughs> all those years playing. You know, right. Everything happens. Um, so another thing I wanted to ask you, you know, it's changed a lot since uh, you started, you know, back in those days. Uh, the orchestras are younger, obviously, now. Um, and the music is can be a lot more complex. Uh, there's a lot of variety being played now because like the, Charlotte, you know, we do ballet, we do opera, we do all the pops concerts. It's like a Swiss army knife. You know, you're playing exactly all the, you know, five movie scores a year. Now. Right. It's pretty much nonstop wall to wall percussion on a lot of these things. Um, and I know it, there were, you know, big concerts back in the day, but it seems to me like it's just getting more and more complex and orchestras are trying to do as much as they can to bring, you know, put butts in seats. Right. And that means that, that, you know, these movie scores where you have one rehearsal, you barely get through it and you're doing John Williams scores, yes. Star Wars and Harry Potter. And, you know, we've, we've, we've done all those. I'm sure you have too. Right. Uh, so, you know, the complexity of, of those things and the setups, which are giant, uh, and maybe you'll have like a three service week with those movies, one rehearsal and two showings. And then also you have to bring in extras, right? several to do that. So did you find yourself pulling from a regular pool of extras in Dallas or were you bringing people in from out of town? We, we did, uh, while I was with the orchestra, we did have a regular pool that we drew from and they still have that pool there but my replacement has been doing what some other orchestras around the country started doing not that long ago i think which is bringing in people from you know players that they knew from outside right from school or from, uh, from yeah other orchestras. from other orchestras yeah and i mean i i i know that uh well the opportunity that I had to play in Atlanta and San Francisco was because of that, you yeah. know, um, because that the, they're doing that. Otherwise, it would never would have happened. Right. Um, but um, uh, I'm not sure. You know, I guess it's a good thing in a way. But I, I, I kind of wonder about the players in the town. Yeah, that's that's what I worry about. Actually. Who who. Uh, need the work and well, they can't get that experience either. and can't get the experience yeah so i i think about that you know when i do weeks like this one yeah. when i'm coming to charlotte uh i enjoy still enjoy playing and meeting making new friends and and working with a different group of musicians but also am cognizant of the fact that uh, my presence might be putting someone else out of out of some work and and well, you think about that. You're local now, <laughs> <laughs> so. I guess. Yeah, but I mean that's that's a thing that that I see happening more and more. Where it didn't in the old days, there was it didn't. I it mean, didn't. yeah, it, it, there was a time when we could not have done that unless there was no one available right. locally qualified to do the job. Right. We could not have brought in someone from the outside, but that's all kind of gone by the boards. Yeah. So, so just keeping with that topic, would you have, you know, since you have taught for many years and, and, and played in the orchestra for many years, would you have any advice for students who are in school now or trying to, 
you know, do this kind of work and get it. You know, it's kind of a catch-22 situation because you're in school and you want to get experience, but you just get experience in the school ensembles, which usually involve more rehearsals unless you're in a conservatory, which that's more of an or a regular orchestra schedule where you might have three or four services of rehearsals and then, and then concerts. Yes. But in the schools, you're doing maybe, you know, several rehearsals, maybe a dozen, right? and then a concert. Right, so right. it's hard for a lot of these students to get the feel of just doing hardly any rehearsals and 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 doing that. So, I mean, do you have any advice for students who are trying to... Well, one place that you can get that kind of experience is summer music festivals. Right. Because that's more of a kind of a professional orchestra kind of environment exactly uh you maybe have like in aspen we have four rehearsals and then we play a concert right. um and i think most festivals that's the way it's structured so yeah. it's more professional that way but other than that uh it is i think it's very frustrating for uh young players today uh you know that you, you can't get into an audition unless you have some experience and you can't get any experience unless <laughs> unless yeah. you can yeah like i can said it's a work in, you, you, you know it's it, uh it's very difficult it is difficult um and another thing and and i think you're a good example of this uh of being versatile and being able to do a lot of different things um I think that has changed from what, you know, I was just, I wanted to be an orchestral percussionist. Yeah. Um, and I played a little drum set and I did, you know, but I was not on a track to be, uh, to be playing drum set professionally. I wasn't, you know, right. I was not on a track to be a marimbist either because I think I told you that, that uh, Charlie Owen told me uh, that one of that I think that first summer I was with him in Aspen, he said, "You know, um, Doug, uh, the time is coming soon when you're not going to be able to get a job in an orchestra unless you're an excellent marimba player." Mm -hmm. But th that he, when he told me that Lee Howard Stevens hadn't even, <laughs> you know, right. ha ha nobody knew who he was yet, right, right. and Lee brought the marimba back into the forefront mm -hmm. of the percussive arts yeah. um, where it had kind of fallen into after the death of Clara Omar, Omar Musser yeah, yeah. and, and, and uh, some of the other well-known marimbas right. of his era, yeah. there wasn't that big of a deal, yeah. you know, but when Lee came, it was a whole new thing. It, yeah. it, it, it he reinvented the yeah. instrument. That's right. Yeah. And, and so it became, so I missed all of that. Yeah. So I played marimba, of course, like right. anyone else in college, right. and played muster etudes and things like that. But right. uh, I did, the, the marimba repertoire just exploded. Yeah, and it continues and, to. And it's, it continues yeah. to after Lee. Yeah, I mean, I have students playing rep now that, you know, that I have undergrad students playing rep now that <laughs> my doctoral students played, you know, sure. five years ago. Absolutely. And just the evolution, it's so fast. The Absolutely. Evolution. And more and more pieces are being written, the complexity. And even we've we've run across orchestra pieces that have difficult marimba parts now. Oh, uh, of course. The last yes. 10 years. I mean, you know, you'd see the Schwantner and all that stuff years ago, but now it's pretty regular in the film scores. And, it and it is. And, in, and, and, you know, fortunately, uh, for for us in Dallas, when when we made our hire in 1996, we had marimba on the list, and we were going to have them play at the finals. Yeah, that would be when we would have them play marimba. Right. Well, because of a rehearsal that was scheduled for that afternoon, we got we ran short on time, and we had to eliminate that. Wow. But we hired a guy who was a fine marimbist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we got lucky. Yeah. But I think most orchestra positions now, they're, yeah. they're going to ask you to play marimba. Yeah, it's expected. I mean, even on our audition that we had, we, we had them play, uh, I think, the Bach B minor, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, sometimes I'm concerned about the state of the, 
the American orchestras, you know, as far as the smaller regional orchestras, as opposed to the big orchestras and where they're going to go. But of course, there's so many students in so many schools wanting to do this. I mean, just the conservatories alone, you know, Eastman and Manhattan and Juilliard and Oberlin and, you know, Curtis. And, you know, you add all those up, there's just not enough space. Well, I'll give you an example. When I first started teaching at the Aspen Festival, pretty much anyone who applied for a while, pretty much if you applied and decided you wanted to go and you had you could afford to do it, yeah, you could come. All right. This year, I just finished watching 58 video auditions, almost the majority of them really fine. Yes. For only 19 positions. Yeah. So one about one third of the students who who applied are going to be able to come. Yeah. Um the the, the level of playing was astonishing. Yeah. Um compared to what it was 25 30 years ago. Yeah, which is um, great. It's fantastic. It is great. But, you know, uh, having places to, you know, have gainful employment. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's where the versatility thing for me is. It, versatility so is very important. Yeah. So that you can, you can go, you know, take a gig playing for the ballet maybe, uh, but the next weekend you might be playing drum set somewhere. Right. Or, 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 or a musical. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, and and then with the orchestra and uh, yeah. one of my colleagues uh, in Dallas uh, at SMU he's on the faculty he teaches marimba for us at SMU and he does everything he's so busy yeah but he plays everything he'll 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 bring out his mallet cat yeah. and 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 have a big setup in a in a pit somewhere right. playing a musical right uh, and the next week he's He's playing a Mahler symphony on stage with the yeah. orchestra and um, drum set with a with a band a rock band that yeah. he plays with and uh, yeah it's uh, that's that's what you got to do yes. I mean yeah and when I was young I did that uh, in New York and I worked all the time and then even before I went to college and then you know that's when I learned about the orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 so right. Like came later, and and uh, and I didn't. Well, I didn't mention hand drumming, but that yeah, that's a yeah. skill that, that, yeah. that I never really got to develop. That yeah. uh, it just wasn't a thing for right. me. For me, yeah. But I think that's a really good skill to have. Absolutely, uh, you know, congas and yes. and and other hand drums. Really important. I mean, um, yeah, and and your, your Latin instruments and mm -hmm. and and some Brazilian. Yeah. And all of that, you're going to run into it somewhere. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, and the last thing, one, one of the cameras probably shut off by now, but we got two on still. I wanted to ask you, uh, this is maybe a little bit of a personal question for you, but do you have any financial advice for somebody who's watching as a performer? You know, you've been doing this a really long time. Uh, if you're in an orchestra, it's pretty stable as far as that goes. But just as far as, I mean, you know, you're, you're I guess, semi-retired now. You're not in Dallas anymore. And, but uh, you've done very well. And do you have any advice that you would want to share with, with anybody as far as that goes? Well, I, I think it's important to remember that there's going to come a time, if you, if you keep waking up every morning, yeah. at some point, you're not going to have that job anymore. Right. And so you have to plan for that. And, and I think a lot of people, a lot of times people in their twenties don't think about that. Yeah. And I remember saying this to our orchestra in a meeting one time and said, look, uh, got to think about the, the pension fund. You can't just say, well, we'll get that the next time around in the negotiations for right. a master contract because People are going to retire, and they're going to need to have some means of support. Um, but I think you've got to really take care of yourself. I, I, I would not count on anything, but if you're, in, if you're taking care of your own needs, 
spend less than you make save it do do learn how to invest even if it's just a little money learn how to invest it in a way that will multiply over the period of, of years and the earlier you start the better that's right yeah. i wish i had started even earlier yeah but but once i realized that i really needed to take care of myself i you know i went at it full bore yeah. you know and i and i tried to make up for lost time yeah so yeah and and uh you know one thing that i talk to my students about i mean a lot of them sometimes are unsure about you know can they really do this can they really make a living and the answer is i always say yes you can and you can do really well i mean i've raised two children you've raised children uh with it and and um you know you can do just as well as anybody else but you just got to be smart yes about how you do it and how you live and you know don't live above your means and everything you're saying so mm -hmm. well thanks so much doug it's such a pleasure having it's so a much pleasure. fun playing with you this my week. pleasure thank you and uh you know we'll go have dinner now okay okay, <laughs> okay. let's do that